Last night, we went into quite a bit of detail in this program about a concept that I imagine is new to a lot of you. It's called incel or involuntary celibates. It was a reference made in a Facebook post by Alec Manassian, the man alleged by police to have run down and killed 10 people and injuring 14 more. Police have confirmed they are now investigating that post to see whether the driver of the van, which took the lives of so many in Toronto on Monday, was motivated by hatred of women or misogyny. The Post celebrates Roger Elliott, a young man in California who killed several people and then himself because, he says, he could not have sex and he blamed women and popular men. My next guest says we need to identify and fight back against ideologies that encourage our young people to play the role of victim in society and then act against us by taking human lives. Jamil Giovanni is a lawyer and author who has a timely new book just out. It's called Why Young Men, Rage, Race and the Crisis of Identity. Here's an excerpt from his new book in which he takes a page, so to speak, from his own life growing up near Toronto. The world looked in fear at young men who acted like gangsters, appeared in mugshots on TV and added to the crime statistics in newspapers. I saw guys trying to make money where money was hard to come by, commanding respect in their neighborhoods and playing a small part in a corrupt system conspiring to hold our community down. I felt rejected by mainstream society because of the way I was treated by teachers, police officers and my family, all of whom were failing to help me solve my problems and often making them worse. This made it easier to identify with the young men my country pointed fingers at. They were rejects like me. We were part of the same tribe. Jamil Giovanni joins me here in studio. Welcome to you. Yeah, thank you. What was your reaction when you heard that a young man was uh, allegedly driving this van that mowed down a lot of people in Toronto? Well, like most people, my initial reaction was, you know, to feel terrible for the victims and their families. And initially, I thought a lot about, you know, how were we going to see this? What were the implications of this going to be? Because we always look for narratives and reasons to make sense of these kinds of tragedies. Patterns. Exactly. Yeah. And. That's why I thought it was most helpful to perhaps focus on what we know for sure. I mean, independent of the motivations of a young man who might go out and hurt people for whatever reasons he might find, there is still the act of hurting people, right? And at its core, that's what I think it's important to focus on because whatever reasons a young person has to commit such an act, ultimately what it, what it means is they have seen themselves as enough of a victim that it's okay to indiscriminately hurt people in our society and that innocent people they've never seen before become symbolic of whatever unfairness they think they're experiencing. And that's at the core of all of these incidents that make our news headlines, whether they're jihadists or white supremacists or lone wolves, whatever, whatever kind of skin takes shape over the trauma. Uh, yeah. That's ultimately what it is. I want to play um, a, another theory that uh, was from a woman we had on the program last night, sociologist Judith Taylor, who is at U of T now, a professor of U of T, but happened to be at Santa Barbara campus in California when they had a similar incident of, of rage uh, there to Elliot Roger. I asked her why young men, excellent question by the way, why young men are more likely to engage in this kind of violence. And here's what she said. I think, um, you know, feminist researchers have talked about comparative entitlement, that young white men feel that they're entitled to a much more than the rest of the population. And so when they're deprived it or they perceive that they're deprived of it, they don't think that it's their personal responsibility to volunteer, to try a different avenue, to read books, to seek help therapeutically. They think that other people have to pay for the fact that they haven't been rewarded. Does that resonate at all? It does. I don't agree with the need to focus on white men in this case because I think there's enough uh, examples of, of men from other communities also uh, exerting violence and rage mm -hmm. that it, I'm not sure it's racially specific. But I do agree that there's a sense of entitlement at the core of this, that, that there is a frust personal dissatisfaction that is now being turned on to society, that I'm not, I don't have the family I wish I had, the money I wish I had, the love I wish I had, whatever it might mm. be, and now I can blame everyone else for that. And there are p ideologies, in cell being one of them, that I think 
puts a lot of um, language and ideas in the heads of young people, and often young men gravitate toward these, that make it easy to point the finger at others, that you can't look in the mirror and see your own responsibility, your own role in potentially making your life better. Instead, it becomes a conspiracy of everyone else working against you. Yeah. That we're, we're all vulnerable to that way of thinking, of, of self-victimization. And I think that young men in particular become vulnerable to ideas that turn that into action. And, and I think in some reasons because of psychological instability, other reasons because we do on a broad scale, you know, we are tend to be more responsible for violence generally and, and crime generally. So it's not surprising that we would also be the ones who wind up in prison for these kinds of actions as well. But I think that it's important to, to see where there's relatability to their way of thinking, that we all can understand feeling un dissatisfied with your life. Mm -hmm. What we don't relate to, though, is why you feel entitled to take that out on others. And that's, that's the moral stance that I think is so important for us to make. Yeah, the impression I get from your story is that you came up in a similar way to a lot of people, young men who are dissatisfied with their lives, not feeling loved. Um, not feeling like you had a role in society, a constructive role in society. Uh, tell me about that and the alienation that you felt and the pattern that you were starting out on. Yeah, I think for me it started off with, you know, not having a father active in the home because it's, I kind of started my life feeling rejected by someone who I thought was supposed to love me. But that then grows to various other ways of feeling rejected, you know, uh, feeling harassed by police officers, feeling like teachers aren't connecting with me, feeling like there are people who owe me something, and maybe rightfully so, that are not giving it to me. And I grew up thinking that that was, uh, my morality could be shaped by the corruption I saw other people exhibit. So if I wasn't getting what I needed from society, now I could become a violent, angry person and that was okay. I could glorify gangsters and criminals I could identify with people who were seen as monsters, maybe, by you know, the news media or my elected officials. That is a reactionary way of living your life. And it led me to a point, you know, several times where I was just so broken down and my self-esteem was so low, um, whether it was you know, failing the literacy test in high school or almost buying a gun uh, when I was in grade 11. And I look back at those moments and I know that I could have been turned into many different things depending on who was around me. And I was fortunate that I was still in school, that I could, you know, find a way to redeem myself at some point while I was in my 20s. How did you do that? What do you think was key? Well, that moment, for instance, where I almost bought a gun, you know, I spent a lot of time looking back at that moment when I was writing my book. And How there, old were you? I was uh, 16 or 17. 16. I was in grade 11. Yeah. And what, what stood out to me as the reason why were two things. One. My mother was the only good thing I had in my life at that point, someone who consistently didn't give up on me. And I thought I might cross a line where I could lose her forever, and that scared me. The second thing was I thought I might be, the police I felt were treating me like a criminal, and in some ways by buying a gun, I felt like I'd be validating the stereotype that I think was being placed on me. Mm. So I took both of those things, and, and those were a, a kind of a rallying call to make a bit of a change in my life. Now, it took me time. It wasn't overnight, right. but it was a pivotal moment for me. And what's key between you know, both of those ways of thinking is that I start to think about the consequences of my decisions for other people. And that's key, thinking about other people. What mm. responsibility do you have to others? How does, you, do your, does your behavior impact the people you care about or people mm. who um, you, you, you know, experience life with? Mm. And that's that way of taking yourself out of the role of the victim and instead mm. thinking about how can you positively affect society is such a, was a key part of my transformation and I think is such a big part of how we need to talk about these issues. That we need to highlight that you don't get to be a victim. I mean, we all experience victimization, and it's important to, to explain that mm -hmm. and to have a voice for that, but not to the point where you get to put that rage on others, right? And, mm -hmm. and we need to be very clear about that and in return offer other ways, other tools to understand your personal dissatisfaction, your up, you're, yeah. you're upset, you're angry, you're unhappy. There's better ways to deal with those problems. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to run by you is another clip of uh, Archie Mann, who is a reporter uh, with Daily Extra. And what he was saying, essentially, is that uh, he kept referring to it uh, uh, in the ways that we talk about jihadism, for example. So he would say um, that this is a form of terrorism, that um, these men get together by the tens of thousands online, radicalize each other, f um, they start with their sexual frustration or domestic abuses, and then they can move on to jihadism, they can move on to other forms of terrorism, or in this case, their purpose to terrorize women. Do you 
agree that that when you start out with that core that you've described of loneliness and isolation and anger that you can follow any of these paths and this is just as much a form of terrorism as any other sure i mean certainly to people who feel the effects of these crimes it, it instills terror so you know i think we sometimes play, worry too much about the words we use but yeah. the re, you know the reality of, of of the suffering is none is the same nonetheless right yeah um, but I do think that core you're describing is what I try to get at in my work. What, when I speak to young people, I'm speaking to that core because I know how common it can be. And I do think it's incredibly important to emphasize how relatable those feelings are to so many of us. So that way, when we see these incidents, we know it's not as if this is an alien dropping out of the sky with emotions and feelings and experiences that we can't better understand. It's actually about making sure enough young people in our society have the tools to deal with these feelings because we know they're going to encounter them. And we also know that, as this incident is an example of, there are now with social media and internet technology, it, there, there's a capacity now for organic communities to pop up online around these feelings. So instead of a young person thinking, I need to wait for this to pass, I need to think differently, I need to try to look at my life in a different way, there are now online communities built around these feelings that say, you're right to feel this way, yeah. you should indulge this, identify with it, make this part of how you see yourself and now go out into the world with that as a central part of your perspective on life. Right. That is what makes dealing with these problems in now, today, in 2018, different from how we encounter violence and hate in the past. Yeah. And, and as you talk about in your book, your book, you said there was no one there to deal with the urgency that you felt. You were searching for moral structure and it was an urgent thing. So there needs to be somebody there to help. Absolutely. I think that we, you know, we, we recognize in some ways the importance of role modeling better in our society today when we talk about you know, the importance of representation, whether it's in the media or corporate boards or uh, whatever it might be. But I think we downplay too often the importance of role modeling when it comes to uh, the community level on an everyday basis. If you don't have role models in the house that are effective, that are talking to you about what you're reading online or showing you how to deal with, the, with adult life in a, in a helpful way, then you're going to need to find those yeah. those role models elsewhere, and that's so that that is integral to how you build a succession plan for what you want your society to be like. If young people don't have examples they can point to and say, "This is what I'm going to be like when I'm 30, 40, 50 years old," then what are we what are we inviting them into? What is the what is the plan to give hand over our institutions and say, "You are now the leader of our of our culture, of our of our society, of our politics." That you can bring some leadership and perspective that is going to make things better and not be resentful mm -hmm. to the these institutions as you grow up. One of the things I'm noticing very quickly, one of the things that I'm noticing about the conversation around this rather than conversations around jihadists in the past or others, uh, gangsters, whatever, what have you, is that there's more of a leap now to what can we do to reach out to these young men to keep them from there rather than the other two groups that I mentioned. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. Same goes for, I think, how we handle alt-right extremism as well. Yeah. Uh, I do you think, think this is part of alt-right extremism? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, want, I don't know enough about yeah. how this young man's mind was shaped to really comment with clarity about it. And I also know that these, these Internet communities can mean different things to different people. Right. But what I do think is very clear is that we've avoided some key identity politics with this tragedy, right? Yeah. It's not someone connected to ISIS. It's not someone who's espousing white supremacist thinking. It's not um, a, a, an inner city gang, right? And so we've been able to escape identity politics in a way, and it's not surprising that that puts us in a more solutions-oriented way of thinking. That it turns out when you're not busy dividing everybody based on their race and religion, it's a lot easier to see the common human experience behind the problem and also identify where maybe everyday people can play a role in solving it. That's the tragedy, I think, of when identity politics takes over how we view these things, is that it, it makes it impossible for everyday people to see themselves in in the tragedy, right? To see, mm -hmm. okay, I can see where this young person's life went wrong and therefore we can identify maybe a role that everyday people can play in supporting young people to avoid this way of thinking. Yeah. Jamil, thank you so much. It was great to talk yeah, to you. Thank you for having me. All right, congratulations on your book. Jamil Giovanni, author of Why Young Men, Rage, Race and the Crisis of Identity.